I wanted to say thank you, David. Uh, he has invited me uh, over some time now, and uh, I really it's a great honor to be speaking this evening in this great school. Uh, I imagine uh, many of you are students. So I see some faces that are friends of mine, um, co-artists. Um, but I think it's a good idea that we take this evening and um, not take it entirely as a screening or as a lecture, um, but really a conversation. Uh, I have picked several clips for you, so again, I think you will leave an impression and know that we really do need your support in going and seeing the film uh, as uh, the commercial um, theatrical release is a challenge and we need all the support that we can. Um, I just thought for the occasion of this evening, um, since some of you um, know me as a photographer and then as a video artist and now as a filmmaker, uh, it may not be bad to speak about these uh, transitions, uh, as maybe some of you as students um, deal with the same question. And trying to think about this today, I, I realized that I think um, the work of artists and the process that they engage in their work definitely reflects their uh, personalities. Um, uh, in a way, it becomes a mirror of who they are. And I keep asking myself, well, why? so much restlessness, so much change, so much uh, new beginnings, and, and this kind of nervousness about wanting to reinvent myself as an artist. Uh, and I realized that actually this has a lot to do with my personality in a way that I have never known any other way of um, keep shedding old skins and creating new skins. Uh, being a nomad, being an Iranian who's living in other countries, now mainly here. Um, the idea of the security and the safety of always being the same never suited me very well. Uh, there seemed to be a desire in me that uh, I really um, need to start over again. Um, and that um, need, um, it's sort of that need for change and the courage to take on the risk of pioneering new ways uh, seems to be showing itself in the way I work but perhaps even in the characters that I depict in my work, uh, in a way that they're so fragile and so insecure, and yet they're so strong and so risk-taking. So coming back to the question of the school, uh, I think that um, nothing perhaps is more terrifying uh, than the idea of stagnation and repetition. And unfortunately, I think we are at risk as students, where as far as I remember when you're a student, you're told that pretty much you search until you discover a particular language style and you just sort of repeat that a thousand times. Uh, I've never been very good at that. In fact, uh, I think I've just sort of rebelled against every system, every language, every identity that I built for myself as uh, a visual artist. Um, and the question of the struggle that takes to take on the change, the courage to reinvent yourself, to throw yourself in the realm of the unknown, not knowing whether the product would be successful commercially or even uh, artistically. Um, and the question of failure, I think we as students, we as artists, we need to embrace the idea of failure and that the struggle is a positive thing and failure is a positive thing. And, and I think many of us, particularly when we get to a certain level of career, we're so afraid of failure and and, and not being always praised. And I've always, um, for some reason, um, have allowed myself to, to make work that are less than good, but, but accept the fact that I've learned so much from this process. Um, when I look at my work, I think I've also dealt with a lot of taboos that I've had to break. Um, and, and I think about a couple of the important ones is, for example, the question of beauty. Um, the beauty that I think in the art world that I know it, in the art history that I studied in the West, it's somewhat taboo that I think, um, and I think today more than anything. And for me, beauty is, uh, is something that came from my cultural background. Beauty and aesthetic is an inherent aspect of our philosophical and spiritual tradition. Uh, I learned to, to embrace beauty uh, in a way that it neutralizes the horror that I, that I look at and I see and I embrace in my own work. Um, I, I see that um, beauty is a way of escaping and having a kind of a, a, an experience that uh, it's 
I would say it's a bit of spiritual experience for me. Um, the question of politics um, is also, I would say, tabooed for artists to be politically vocal, politically active. Uh, I've always troubled, um, I've always had trouble with this question because being in Iran, from Iran, uh, and, and living in this US, and being active in the art world that is primarily dominated by Western artists, and yet my whole life has been defined and, and sort of controlled by the question of politics. I, for a long time, tried to do without the question of politics, but I couldn't. And, and finally, I've also taken the next step, which is I have no shame to say I'm also an activist. Uh, I, I feel no shame at all the fact that not only my work can speak for very important issues that I think are important to my community and to the world, but that also that I could stand here and say, as artists, we can also um, take political position. And this takes me back to the position of Iranian artists, um, that whether you're an Iranian artist living in Iran or outside of Iran is inescapable of the question of politics. Those who are in Iran are living with the question of um, censorship, the question of harassment, arrest, torture, and execution. Us who are living outside, we are in exile, we're not able to go to our country, we're bitter and angry from this lack of access to our place of origin, not being able to visit our family. So the sense of resentment and the way in which our daily lives, our past, present, and future is defined by politics leaves us no luxury but being involved with the question of politics. Um, and I think this is something very different in this country in a way that you have that luxury of distancing yourself from the question of politics. Um, so having said that, I have friends now, for example, Jafar Khanahi, one of the greatest living Iranian filmmakers in prison. Um, and and uh, you know, uh, I can endlessly name people. And, and so therefore, I want you to just for a moment imagine being an Iranian artist where your critics are not only the New York Times or Art Forum or or, or art in America, but the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, and the fact that if I go to Iran, I might get arrested, my family could be, etc., etc. Without being melodramatic, I, I just want you to realize that um, why it is impossible for us Iranian artists, and I really cannot think of a single Iranian artist, filmmaker, writer, whose work is somehow not political. Um, and having said that, I think we need a little bit more activism in this country ourselves. Um, the artists, I think, should also think about that art is not just in this void of the art world and the Chelsea galleries, etc. And again, this may seem more of a confession and more intimate of an evening because I imagine there will be students here. And, and I want you to know that I went to school and I had to abandon school for about 10 years to return to school. Uh, to, to making of art. And, and the only reason of my return is my faith again in art and in the way that it could have an impact above and beyond galleries and museums and commodities. Um, if I could now look at my work throughout, and I'm going to briefly talk about these transitions, um, whether it's in a photograph or a video or a film, there are certain things that are constant. Um, and if I mention those um, the work is extremely personal, meaning that um, if you uh, eliminate the, the personal uh, aspect of this work and the way that it was developed based on a single Iranian woman living outside, basically my point of view, my bicultural experiences, someone caught between East and West, someone who's living in between two worlds in total conflict, uh, someone who has been um, uncontrollably distanced from her own family and country. Um, the sense of nostalgia, the need to communicate, all of that. Um, and if you only look at this work as a dialogue about the world of Islam or the situation of women, the world will fall, fall flat. Uh, the emotional, the psychological, the uh, aspect of this film, of this work, all of the work, is entirely based on who I am and me as a human being facing my own personal anxieties, fragilities, vulnerabilities, fears, hopes, uh, all those things that any human being will have. And these are very particular to me, but this monologue 
somehow has found its way into a dialogue. Uh, the question of poetry, um, and I think this film that you will see, hopefully the entire thing, when I look at it, the entire thing is a piece of poem. And it's a piece of poem that is rooted in classic Persian poetry, um, yet it's all about conceptual art rooted in Western art history. So my work has always been about this fusion, this very strange fusion, as I am myself, an entity of a hybrid between East and West, between the Islamic world and the, the Western world. The, every work that I have met in some ways borrows from the art history as we know it in the West, and yet a, a really a long history of poetry and tradition in Islamic and Persian world. And um, the second thing, the third thing I wanted to point out is this subject of duality. Uh, and again, maybe this has something to do with my own bicultural existence in a way that I am never able to see anything in totality. I'm always making work that is about Iran, but I'm not only talking about Iran, I'm only talking about Iranians. I'm talking about all of you and about everything that we are concerned about. I am not able to ever have a total command, as we know it, about any culture. I can never speak with truth about the country of Iran, but also I can never completely speak truth about the country of the United States. So whatever I make is a projection of who I am and in the way that my communication will never be pure. So in that sense, every word that I've made has a sense of personal, the social, the local, the global, the violence, and the spiritual, etc. Um, now, I'd like to just go quickly through the transition that the film, the work has made. I keep saying film and forgetting that I actually started as a photographer. And if I may say so, finally I've come to the conclusion that the fundamental difference between what is art and what is cinema is that art making, perhaps, I could assume, is about creating concepts, where filmmaking is about telling stories. Um, and when I look back at my very first work, and I won't stop and explain in detail about the themes of each work because I'd like to also get to the film and spend more time on it. But for example, this group of work, um, Women of Ayla, um, again, it was a conceptual attempt to, to depict the character of a typical martyr. Uh, again, the sense of duality, the sense of submission, and yes, yet defiance that I sense in this character. Someone who, who loved God and was devoted to her religion, was willing, but was willing to commit cruelty and, and be violent and ultimately had an obsession with death. Um, these were not really stories, but were about creating this um, sort of uh, characters, this, this beings that sort of represented ideas of the the Islamic fundamentalism, as I recognize it when I went back to Iran. Um, and again, at that time, it was my very first group of artwork, which was when I first returned to Iran after 10 years of not making work. And, and at this point, again, my approach was very conceptual, that I was going to minimize my vocabulary to the weapon, to the veil, to the writing, and to the female body. Soon later, I as people started to know me as this photographer who basically wrote on the photographs, you see? At the beginning, most people actually hated those photographs. They said, oh, I'm just trying to sensationalize violence of Islamic fundamentalism, etc. But soon they became very marketable and people started to buy them and collect them. <coughs> For some odd reason, I decided to go to a video. And when I look back, and I think the reason, if you look at them, even if you speak about the aesthetic of this, they're very much similar to the woman of Allah in a way that they're so monumental, they're very sculptural. So in other words, for me, it was this idea of taking the power of still photography, but giving it a little bit of a story. And also that by video, the moving image sort of moved away from this idea of objects, but creating an experience. 
With Turbo Ambitions in 1998, I created uh, two projections where people were sitting in between and were watching this duet, this musical battle between a man and a woman. So what happened was this piece became sculptural, it became choreographic, it incorporated music, story, and also choreography. Um, and, and the most important thing for me was the idea of getting out of the studio. And that truly, if making art, as we know it as studio art, is a solitary experience, there is something wonderful about working in film and video that is a very communal experience. Uh, and for me, being the person that I'm very grassroots and really care deeply about going to communities and, and us beginning to work in Morocco, it opens a huge dimension for me in the sense that I never directed a film before, I never worked with a professional crew before, um, I was just storyboarding, the ideas were very conceptual once again, men on one side, women on the other side. The story was really not a story, it was just a, a kind of choreography of dance, a movement of a hundred men and a hundred, uh, in a fortress and a hundred women toward the sea. Um, this became like a poem, but it really sort of opened up this whole realm of possibilities for me. That, look, I don't have to abandon photography. I can continue with photography. Every frame of this film rapture was a photograph, but yet it was moving. Yet it allowed me to tell a little story. It allowed me to bring music. It allowed me to do choreography. And also to create an experience that for 10 minutes, it could you know, create um, uh, something very different than if you were just passing by a photograph. Um, I also fell in love with the experience of working with a team in, uh, in filmmaking. Uh, at that point, I met my colleagues, who I hope she will meet us later tonight, um, uh, and, and, and Susan the Hindu singer, and many of us continued. Uh, we were Iranians, uh, we were all living in exile, none of us could go back. Uh, we were all going to Morocco, and it was just an amazing uh, opportunity for us to become a community that is artistic, but also um, incredibly um, close culturally. So uh, I'm going to now focus back again on the transition of still photography. Again, as you can see here, every single frame of this film was a particular photograph. Um, you know, less narrative, um, far more aesthetic. Um, and always working with a storyboard, not really writing a script. Um, in year 2000, um, the film uh, Fervor that I think I made for the Whitney Biennial, the story became a little bit more expansive. Uh, I remember that was the first time I actually worked with professional actors. Um, but it really very much borrowed from the aesthetic of Turbulent, Woman of Allah, and Rapture, in a way that, once again, really um, focused on the masculine, the feminine, the black and white, um, and, and the, the way the camera moved, the way that the music involved itself, the, the whole experience became very highly stylized and aesthetic. Um, so from 1998, when I made um, Turbulence, um, up until 2005, I guess I made about 13, 14 videos. Um, this was one film that most of you have not seen. It was the closest I could say to a short film. Uh, and it was called The Last Word. It was about an experience that was very similar to mine of, of a woman who's a poet, a woman of imagination, going to face her interrogator. Um, oddly, this uh, film that was shot in 2004 has great resonance for a lot of us artists. Um, uh, people who are in prison, people who are constantly being um, sort of um, considered criminal because of the power of the imagination. Um, and I, I really feel that uh, in some ways um, this again pays tribute to, to, to the power of artists in the Iranian society in the sense that they speak the voice, the heart of the people, and they really do create a threat to the order of the government and the society. Uh, and, and this at once gives you a lot of power, but at the same time, uh, it's really paralyzing because you're not free. So this uh, film was a, a, a sort of a 20 minute film that really paid tribute to this um, encounter between a man who represented the banality and the rhetoric of the government versus a woman who's a poet and is a woman of creativity and, and power of imagination. And, and, and that he attacked her with her, his word of rhetoric and her answer was in the form of poetry. 
Um, again, uh, continuing on with the video installation, some of you may have seen this video that I collaborated with uh, Philip Glass uh, for the first time using color, for the first time using, uh, well, working with an uh, American composer, uh, which later led on to Ryuchi Sakamoto, who just did a beautiful composition for Women Without Men. Um, but again, uh, us working in Morocco, again, not really ever being able to work anywhere like in Iran. So Morocco, Mexico, Turkey, and now Egypt have become our uh, places where we actually go to make believe that it's Iran. Um, so I actually feel very much at home in Morocco. Um, so again, the story didn't really exist here. It was a really very much organized like a poem. Um, but with Tuba, uh, another actually film that we shot in Mexico. But interestingly, if Women Without Men focuses a great deal with the subject of an orchard that becomes a, a place of exile for the woman, I now understand why after September 11, I made this film, uh, which um, to us Iranian people, and I think international university, the garden represents a, a symbol of paradise, a place of refuge, a place that one could feel secure. Uh, in the Iranian culture, it has also political ramifications. It's a, it's a space of freedom. So for me, after September 11, uh, I, I felt um, a, a great um, um, sense of vulnerability living in the city. And I made this one piece that created uh, a, a sort of a, a metaphoric connection between what this tree of Tuba that comes from the Quran, um, the, the tree of paradise, and the garden as a sacred space. Um, and then the people who ran through it, through it um, to take refuge, uh, and a few men, I promise not to talk in detail, but um, here I am. Uh, some of the men who uh, obviously represented people of power. Um, so really quickly, uh, another double projection that I actually performed in it myself, uh, but another kind of aesthetic exercise of, of um, the, you really hear the question between East and West, traditional society versus modern society, and a woman being literally caught in between the two. Um, these are all, um, I think, 1999. Now, why cinema? Um, I'm going to, first of all, explain to you that um, my, um, I think my interest in cinema began in 2002. After um, doing so many biennials, so many exhibitions, I felt that I needed to take a step back from the art world. Um, and I think that by now, having felt closer to the language of cinema, having found uh, a kind of seduction towards cinema, the idea of storytelling, the idea that all the work I had made up to now um, treated the characters, people, as simply statues, that I never learned how to go inside their minds. And if you think back about Rapture or Turbulent or Fervor, um, it was always um, devoid of identities. The people became more emblem or representative of a larger subject. Uh, and for me, I wondered, uh, could I really tell a story? Could I really make a film that goes into character study? Uh, could I write a script, uh, all of that? At the same time, I have to say, um, there was a rebellious in me that I wanted to step out of the galleries of walls, uh, of, well, the walls of galleries and museums and go closer to the grassroots. For me, there is, and I, I'm sure some of you will disagree with me, there is a democracy in cinema that I don't find in the art world in the sense that it's unimaginable that you can go today to any contemporary modern uh, museum, that you can comprehend anything that is hanging on the wall um, without having some education of art history. Uh, but you can go see a film and see a story and watch a story and understand it without the need of having studied the history of cinema. Um, I felt cinema is closer to the pop popular culture. I felt the entire Iranian community that knew me, uh, knew me as an artist, but never stepped inside of the gallery and museum to see my work. It was too enigmatic, too inaccessible. Uh, and so I said, could I make a work of art that my own mother would understand? And could I make a film um, that is at once true to the power of visual art, the aesthetics as we know it, uh, the enigma that we carry, and yet um, give it a story that is comprehensible and it's possibly even commercial. Um, and I, I, I know this was a lot to aim for, and, um, and particularly because by changing um, this parameter, meaning that 
by leaving the gallery leaders and museum curators and art critics, you're embracing film producers, uh, distribu uh, film distributors, film producers, film festivals, film critics. Um, and you're a student, you are nobody. Uh, and, and that the chances of failure is far greater than success. I knew that, um, but there was no way to stop me, and I'm not trying to sound courageous. Um, but I felt so strongly that I needed to take a stop from the art world and, and, and to take on this risk. Now, then the question was, what story were you going to go into making your first film? Uh, and this was really a um, hard one because, um, you know, I, I read so many um, books, uh, the Iranian novelists, etc., and I finally came across the book of Women Without Men. Um, I have had an obsession with Iranian women authors, uh, and mainly because uh, I feel as an Iranian woman, I felt a great strength in them, both in their art of writing, but also as a life that they had lived, in a way that I idealized them as women who struggled in such difficult situations. Shamusha Parsipur is a woman who spent several years in prison, I think once for five years. Um, she had uh, suffered from absolutely everything you can imagine. Mental illness, separation from her son, um, and exile, and poverty. Um, but this is not why I, read, I fell in love with her. I, I read her book first. Woman Without Men is one of the most beautiful stories. It's not a perfect story. It's a magic-related story. Um, but it's a, a kind, of a, a kind of a story that your grandmother would tell you, that someone said that it's very hard to believe, but because it is your grandmother, you believe everything they say. Because you never dare to question your, your grandmother. I love the way that Shanusha Parsifal, with such command, could write scenes that were just totally magic, that like a woman just being resurrected out of the grave, and then go right back into normal reality. Um, and I thought, it's either her mental illness or incredible courage. Um, but I read this story many, many, many times. And I thought, this is perfect, because if my work in the past had a foot in questions that really dealt with emotional, psychological, existential issues of all women, all human beings, and yet had a foot in sociopolitical realities related to my country, here's a novel that has a foot in this utopian orchard where a few women go to take refuge, and yet has the potential that the book didn't really dwell on the political element, but we expanded it, has a foot in the summer of 1953 in Iran, when there was a coup d'etat by the CIA and removed our beloved prime minister. So I thought, I cannot think of any better balance than navigating this philosophical, spiritual, emotional crisis of this woman versus the social crisis of the country. So, in a way, the country and the woman became one. So the country became a fifth character. Of course, me and Shoja, who just entered the room, uh, we were three years on the script to make this work. Um, also, I have to say this novel was beautifully um, uh, visual. I could not imagine any uh, novel that could lend itself to more magnificent images. What I underestimated was the struggle. And I don't want any of you to underestimate the transition that an artist makes going from a 10-minute film to a full feature-length film. Um, it's not just the script, and it's not just long years of working. Um, it's many, many, many others. Um, I think the most difficult is, would the ultimate final product be worthy of that 66 years of work? Does it translate to the general audience? Does it keep the right balance between visual arts and cinema um, and the authenticity of the period that it takes place, the, power, the, the, the novel that is so loved by Iranian people? So as I stand here, the film is just opening, so we are getting reactions. Um, I'm not going to talk too much more about the film until I come, but I wanted to give you this introduction. Um, and that these images are actually, I have to say um, for the art students, that along with the feature length film, I created five video installations that each focus on one of the female characters of the novel. Mahdo is a woman um, from the character of the book that I actually eliminated from the feature. She was far too magic. 
uh, but we get uh, four others. But I made the video, and I hope one day we will have a museum that would invite us in New York one day, uh, where I could show all uh, five videos. And then you understand the logic that we went about editing just five, ten minute short video installations that basically focus on the characters as opposed to telling the whole story of women without men as opposed to the feature. Zari, I think some of you may have seen the video installation at Barbara Glasson. Um, gallery, I think it was in 2005. Um, but this, of course, I made photographs and um, along with the video installation. I also saw someone else walked into the room, the production designer of this film, just flew in from Germany, so I will have him come later, who built all of that, what you see here. Creating Iran in 1953, Morocco, with a small budget, was no small chore. We'll share with you that later. Um, this is some of the artworks um, that was produced. Um, I'm going to just go fast through them because, again, um, I would like to leave as much possible for our discussion and your questions that might come up uh, about the film. Um, I have chosen, um, basically, um, three clips. You'll see about 35 minutes. Um, basically, uh, between the three clips, you'll have moments of black. Um, and then um, I hope we'll come back for Q&A, and hopefully you'll go and see the whole film. Thank you for your patience. Arita is a painter, someone who posed for my photograph, and she agreed to play the role. Shoja Azari, who is the co-director, and come up, Shoja. Please, people, remember to face on children. And Shaman, can you please come up the production designer? But her beautiful face was also in the photographs that you saw, especially the one with the gun here, speeches. It was her. Um, we met many years ago in New York. She was an artist and myself, and we became friends and did this photograph. And eventually, I asked her if she would play the role. Shaman just arrived from Germany. He's the onion. <laughs> He did a magnificent job in the production design. He's a painter also. Um, he paints and does production designer. And Shoja, who I met when we made the video Turbulence, um, and um, some of you may remember his face from the beautiful song that he sang. Um, but he's an artist himself, a filmmaker. Um, but he co wrote the script and co directed the film. Um, so at this point, if you have any questions, and I'm sorry, the film went on and on, and I wanted you to go see the finished film at Coat Cinema, maybe Nico Cinema, in May 14. But at this point, any questions? You have, I have to give him a hug because I haven't seen him. <laughs> okay. So any questions? We just saw each other after months, just now. So, um, uh, What was the most difficult part in transitioning your creative process into the cinema and making it more story oriented? Well, um, I had the luxury to have Shoja, who has worked with me for a long time and knows my work very well. I think that when we work as visual artists, for example, the, the question of pacing, when I make videos, I'm very slow. Uh, and the nice thing about gallery and museum audience, they're very patient. And if they get bored, they just walk out and see another video. Um, but there's never a question about losing their attention. Uh, but when an audience sits in a um, seat in a theater for two hours, um, you know, you have to think about pacing. And the other thing is that um, the images themselves can only hold attention for so long. In fact, sometimes beautiful, strong images can be very dangerous because they can distract from the continuity of the story. And you don't want to get lost and drained by just one beautiful image after another. So the continuity of the story, the narrative connection, uh, and the way in which you make people feel close to the character um, it, it was the most difficult for me. Uh, and, and this is something I, I always laugh because now I'm making films and Shoja is making art and film. But, um, this is one thing that I was afraid to take this leap into a very narrative style of, for example, dialogues. And for example, Fahri was one of the more realistic characters. Um, she and Foyze, uh, they were the most difficult for me. 
She was easy, but but, but, <laughs> <laughs> but Munez and Foy and Zain, who were very kind of abstract characters, they were very unworldly. One flies and resurrected after death, and the other one sees faceless men. She never spoke a word. Those were really easy for me. But this transition in, in characters that were really realistic, their needs were realistic, and they, um, everything about them was just not so realistic, it was new to me. Um, I was terrified of dialogues, um, but this is why it took about 300 scripts and about 200 different versions of the edit. <laughs> well, it's a more general question, but I was wondering, um, you were talking about censorship in Iran and also kind of more maybe symbolic censorship, especially in terms of when we talk about Islamic cultures in the West, uh, do you sometimes feel that it's difficult to speak and to be an activist and to, to express your opinions? Well, I think every one of these guys could say something about that. I mean, it's true that this film, um, I think the very central theme of the film is about the notion of freedom. And I think what is really missing in our country is the freedom of expression. And, and the reason, perhaps, why so many of us Iranians embrace the poetic language is because it's so subversive and it's the only way in which we could say everything that we can up front. And I think that um, in terms of um, being an artist, I always felt better just making the work that speaks about it, but not being vocal publicly about it. But since the summer, and I, I think most of us have found ourselves in a very weird position because the work is not enough. Some of us do have a presence, do have a voice in public, and if we can speak out for the process of democracy and the young people who are in trouble, we have an obligation to do. So I speak for myself, it's the choice of not being vocal active because it really is very awkward to be. Today I found myself um, just since this is an intimate evening, my friend Jack Bagman, he's in prison, and we're trying to do everything we can to help him. I went to a luncheon for Tribeca Film Festival, and I was sitting next to a man who works for Hillary Clinton. He's his um, advisor for the Middle East. Uh, somehow we're in the same jury. And I thought to myself, Hillary Clinton, Jack Bagman, and I thought, and I started to talk to him about could I talk to you about it, something, and you know what it means if she says one word about his name? And he felt immediately uncomfortable, and I felt really uncomfortable. And then I realized, um, there's a group De Niro, he could sign the petition. Um, and who else is in this room? And I was realizing that I felt like a salesperson, because going around to celebrities, asking for their help. And to be very honest, the immediate reaction I got was like, oh God, you know, this, and this is not feeling very good. But then I thought, there's a poor guy in prison for no reason at all. And here I'm going to get caught up with my ego. It's my job. Um, so I'm saying for us to be like that, it's not easy because um, being an activist sometimes is misinterpreted as exhibitionists, as people who want to bring attention to themselves. Um, and yet, you feel so strongly about the movement and you want to help. Maybe Shuja, you can elaborate a little bit on what it's like to be an artist and activist. Or any of you, we are all artists and activists. <laughs> Shadon was in prison for a few years. <laughs> Shadon, actually, you talked about that. You <laughs> but, but you have to move here. I, I'm sorry, I cannot break the law. <laughs> you forgot your English? <laughs> um, was <laughs> Actually, Sharon is here also um, because he was a production designer for a wonderful, um, talented director, Rasul Roof, who happened to be with Jafar Kamani in Iran, and they arrested them all. Um, they released um, Rasul Roof. Um, his film is called The White Meadows. The White Meadows. White Meadows. It's, it's in the competition in um, here in Tribeca. And um, they took his passport away, and Sharon is here to represent the film. The director is that they work together with, with Jaffa Panayi. Yes, and they, they were the in the house working a short film. Four o'clock in the morning, they were by they the hoodie. Take the mic. Oh. They, they <laughs> <laughs> take the yeah, mic. Jaffa, uh, Rasulov and Jaffa Panayi was making the film. 
Uh, Rasulov actually called me three weeks before and he asked me that to go and uh, work on it. And uh, <laughs> I was thinking and at the time that in thinking uh, and uh, how you know that about, uh, and then arrested. And uh, this uh, Rasulov, the, the director for the, the White Mado, just for one week or so something like in jail and Panoi. And they work very simple uh, story about the one, the family. The guys come back from the uh, in Tehran, and they see his uh, son is uh, uh, is this the uh, okay. in jail in the house. That's a film start. But and the Iranian government said it's something film uh, for the government or something like that. That work together. Rasulov from Panahi and Rasulov, uh, Panahi no, is in there. Panahi is the one the really best Iranian filmmaker and always he did six, seven films and never show in Iran and uh, that's very terrible for all Iranian artists, for all the world to see one the really fantastic filmmaker and the, for no reason to be in the chair. Actually, I had a question about art. What's it like to be an artist? Yeah. Uh, what's it like to be an artist in Iran today? Could you say you make abstract painting, Mondrian, abstract expressionist painting, but you could make a political statement? Is that showing where you would be able to do one thing and not another? Well, I should let uh, Arita answer this because she had just come back from Iran more recently than myself. And she's a painter. Um, my feeling is that most Iranian are successful, they'll show, mostly they don't show their work in the underground or they show in Dubai or the United States or in the West. Um, majority of artists are allowed to show in Iran are those whose work is acceptable by the government. In fact, we have to submit an entire body of work before we gather an exhibition to see if it's appropriate. Um, but Arisa, you want to come here and expand on what it's like to be a painter? <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable? Basically everything is censored. Uh, the censorship all over. The minute you are having a political uh, conversation to the viewer, it gets busted. The gallery is shut down. Uh, actually nowadays it's more and more difficult every day before an exhibition. Everything has to be given to the Conseil of Advisors to approve the show. Um, actually. Uh, I have a very close person of mine that I don't want to mention. You never know, ears are listening. That uh, she had a major uh, a collective uh, or, um, young artist that they had a very political, um, a strong political um, view, and it was all expressed in their work. And the gallery was shut down. So it's really not easy. And many artists leave the country however they can. The work that gets exported outside, like sent outside, we have to like sneak it out. Basically, we cannot ship it normal uh, situation. Um, I can no longer go back to Iran. Um, it's it's not Is it easy. because of me. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> the collaboration eventually got deeper and deeper and deeper. But uh, I don't want to go back to Iran. This is also not the truth right now. Um, it's become very cruel. A lot of people are disappearing, a lot of people are being tortured, a lot of people are being killed, and nobody talks about it. It's all hush, hush, hush. Well, yeah. But actually, I should show maybe you can mention about your own struggle for the work that you're about to show in New York and how um, controversial that has become. Do you want to share that, or is that too intimate for the moment? It's too intimate. OK. He's having issues himself on this end. Uh, anyway, so. Only problems. Maybe this is good for the American students. They realize how free they are. And maybe so much freedom is not a good thing. <laughs> getting spoiled by that. A little hard time is not so bad. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about the positive reactions that your work has received from other women, other women not exposed to Western art. So other women who view your work not through the filter of Western art, whether in Iran or. 
these? Whether they are you asking me the question if they are positive? Or, or, or what, what are the positive reactions? In Iran, they, they cannot really see the work, although I have to say something really wonderful. Uh, our very first premiere of this film was in Los Angeles, April 9th. On April 8th, my sister called from Iran and she said, I just took our mother to the movie and we decided to go next door to a shop. And guess what? I just bought five copies of your film. <laughs> <laughs> I love the piracy in the The film is not even released in the US. They already copy it and sell it at the stores. A film that is completely taboo and completely a problem for nudity, for cyberbullying. I love the courage of young young people. Um, may I say that this film will never be completely indoors and not completely resisted and denied by women, men of cultures, different cultures. I think this is a film that would be for sure controversial. Um, it's, I've shown this film in Dubai with a room full of women with the veil, and I was swearing that they're going to walk out as soon as I see Zayn naked in the bathhouse or some of the scenes that are very strong. No, never even mention of it. Um, and yet I've seen American people walk out of the room when they see Zadie naked scrubbing herself. Um, the, the truth is that the women in this film, their crises are not only about Muslim women. Uh, Fakhri's obsession with uh, wanting to start over again, wanting to be a singer, wanting to be desired. Um, Zadie's problem with anorexia and the desire to be saved and loved. Um, Faiz's rape and the fact of having to cope with that. Um, and women's desire for social justice and, and activism. These are all very universal issues that I don't believe that we could reduce to an Iranian woman crisis. But nevertheless, I, I, I have to say this film will not be one that would be loved by everyone. It would be a lot of discussions, and that's a good thing, but it would be controversial, like everything I've ever done. <laughs> I want to ask you, um, about the particularities of the female characters and as well as the, uh, the overall uh, reach of the culture. Um, it seems like when you get into the individual characters of the anorexic woman and uh, a few others, they eventually become so desubjectified, if you want to use that word, that they have to hallucinate because there is no other option. And in, uh, in the form of a group of the party, the way that the man begins to play the instrument and sing in front of the soldiers, uh, the only escape is that absurdity of playing for the soldiers. And I wanted to know if you thought there were any way of presenting an escape route for maybe the face of a larger group of people, um, or if the seriousness of the larger group of people, of the culture, is kind of the, the overall message. And it's just that kind of brick wall, or not necessarily brick wall, but there's a, it's a lot of little chinks of absurdity and magical uh, realism and hallucination that can break that down. Yes, I, the question you asked is a very good one and it's very complex to answer because this film was very ambitious um, because on the one hand, we really wanted to get to the depths of each woman's uh, and individual dilemmas um, that transcended the specificities of the country and issues of ethnicity and all of that. And yet, we wanted to recreate um, the social crisis in Iran at the time. We were very adamant about um, characterizing Iran in the 50s when it was a secular society. Um, when it was a very sophisticated and complex society of diverse group, uh, very wealthy, upper class, westernized people, very religious people, communists, uh, pro-Mossadegh, all kinds of people. And that whenever you put all these two people together, there is um, a kind of an absurdity and a wonderful accidental thing that happen when you put very diverse type of people. And, and there is something to say about Iranian people that we really wanted to capture in this film, which is and I think to this day it happens, the worst of moments and crisis, they manage to um, recite poetry and laugh and have humor. Like uh, when Jafar and he was arrested, they were having a party. 
They came and arrested 16 people, just like this party that was raided all of a sudden. And I've heard from many people where, while they're getting arrested, they're cracking jokes and, you know, like, oh, you're getting how many belts, how many, you know. I mean, there is some way that somehow the Iranian people have, I'm not saying it's um, tolerated or liked, but they are coping and surviving in a way that really, truly, truly represents the, the spirit of the Iranian people and how they transcend the, the, the pain of the time. So what I really think we were trying to do is to show the pain of the individual woman and the pain of the society as a whole as it was fighting for democracy, it was uh, fighting against imperialism, and, and that it too was very confusing because some people wanted different things. Um, but it was difficult to do it in fiction because this is a monumental moment in Iranian history and try to put that in within a story of four women is very ambitious. Considering yourself um, not only political but an artist, I'd like to know what forms of art by other artists, contemporary or historical, sustain you? Uh, what art do you like to look at? What books or sort of books, text do you like to read? What music? I hate to disappoint you, but I never had a hero in the modern art or contemporary art. I love and admire many artists, many of them I know. Um, but I've never, ever since I was a student in art, I had any particular hero. I have had um, film directors that have done that to me, where um, they transform me and they have made me regain um, this strong faith in art in the way that they resonated in me. And that's never happened to me um, in the art history as I know in my Eurocentric education. Um, and I watch Tarkovsky, and maybe because he's from, you know, from Russia, his culture, his the oppressive environment, the darkness of his stories, yet the poetic and the emotional, philosophical level of his storytelling and his images really move me. Uh, or when I look at, um, for example, lately I've been really watching Bergman or like even Kislovsky from Poland, I seem to identify more with cultures, uh, artists that are kind of resonate in me, something that I, I find of a struggle, which is to find beauty and humanity in, in horror and ugliness and, and stupid politics. Um, and, and, and I think that there are many people in that realm that have succeeded a great deal in filmmaking and the way they tell the story, visually and in their narrative. That unfortunately, I mean, I love William Kentridge, I love Marina Abramovich, I love endless number of people, but nothing has moved me. And I remember when I met a great teacher, a Iranian director, he said, I ask you to see these films, and when you see these films, write down the date that you see this film, the hour, because your life would never be the same. And I really believe that, that some great work of art, great films, have changed me, and I'm grateful for that. The, the song that you have in the movie, this guy is singing, is very much like the ghazals that we have in India. They're couplets, they're sung very much in the same <coughs> manner. And no Indian party is complete without someone singing that other at the end. These were some observations. Oh, yes. I, I wanted to say that I cannot take a lot of the credit for the film. And I, I know Shuja has been very shy, and he's sitting there. But he has everything to do with this film. For example, even the selection of the songs and, and the scene of the party when the, the army raided. Um, these are things that, for example, I left Iran when I was 17. Mind you, I mean, um, and so together we had to go back and research a lot of this material, um, the music, the, the costume, the, even the interaction, political material, the, the social environment. And these guys, both Shahram, for example, Shahram has spent a great time in the brothels in New York, not just kids. <laughs> 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 No, it was like a great, it was this question of the brothel that was actually a city of prostitution that during the Shah was actually allowed. And we tried to recreate the city in Morocco. And we kept saying, well, how can we do this? And so suddenly everybody said, well, I've been there. <laughs> the Shah was a production designer, so I said, thank God for his expertise. But, 
were talking about um, feeling the pressure of the art world to have a voice, have a style, have a language. And one of the things I find really interesting about your work is that you have this very um, nuanced, balanced relationship with that. You, you have a very clear voice, you have a very clear style, and you're willing to play with shifting and changing. Can you just talk a bit about how that manifests in your artistic practice? Well, one thing I find very interesting that um, it's challenging enough that an artist tries to take a, a turn at, sort of against their own, you know, way of working. But it's another thing is um, to get your audience to go along with you to take that turn. We have very lazy audience. Please don't get insulted. But majority of the people, when I learned, when I did the black and white photographs, later when I made the video, they said, oh, I really like her photographs. I made turbulent. Then I made Rapture. It's, oh, I really like Turbulent. I hate Rapture. And then I made, like, uh, the color was Passage. Oh, I love Rapture and Turbulent, but I hate. And I realized this pattern of resisting, uh, resistance against artists who make moves, who suddenly change uh, their style. Uh, although, if you really look carefully, the artist hasn't changed so much. It's just they are experimenting. But this notion of experimenting, it's very difficult for the artist. But it's almost 90% of the time it works against them by the critic, by the audience, because they always compare to what they know before. This has happened to me. I mean, imagine going from those black and white photographs to the video and then suddenly to this feature. Most people thought I was way too ambitious and why do this? Um, and many of my own close friends advised me not to go about making a film. Um, they, they said I was making a big mistake, that it would not work. And it probably won't work, it won't be a huge success. But, but the very fact is that our audience, our public, would like to recognize an artist with this particular style and have them elaborate on that style a thousand times. They don't like it when you shed skin because they are uncomfortable to expand their mind. And we need to challenge our audience and our critics and our gallery curators and say, we are the artists. We make the decision what's ahead, not you. Because normally, lately, I'm sorry, we have a lot of diversity and I love these people, but it seems to me that it's reverse happening, where we're following the curators, the dealers, and, and the critics, uh, where the artists didn't used to be like that. We are challenges, and we are supposed to be taking risks, and we have to tell them to follow us at the risk of failure. And I cannot insist enough because, believe me, I've made a lot of bad work. And this film, when I watch it, I see so many problems. So I'm not standing here as one competent artist saying, oh, I'm so, you know, whatever. It's, I think it's really, this is a very important message, I think, at least to resonate to our students. Today, in my conversation with this gentleman that I won't name his name, he said, well, does he have a U.S. passport? I said, I can't believe you just asked that, because um, he is actually one of the first people who encouraged Twitter and Facebook to make sure to keep the channels open for young Iranians who were sending um, you know, videos from Iran. And he himself, this young boy, told me tonight, he's very young, that what is phenomenal is how that video of Neda dying, the amount of time it took from the moment it was shot in Iran, sent to New York or to US, and Obama saw it by two hours, and then Sarkozy and this and that, the power of technology. I said, but excuse me, sir, you're talking about a generation of Iranian people who have inspired you. You're talking about them as if they're so heroic. You're talking about defending them talking to Twitter and this and that, and yet you're asking me if they have an uh, American passport. Jafar Panahi is an artist who has made great contribution to the world film. He is not 
just some local artist, you know, even if he was. These people are fighting for democracy. Democracy is basic human rights. If we don't defend this democracy in Iran, it will all like spread everywhere else. So how can you be so inspired, publish their images here and there, and the minute they get arrested and quieted, then you turn your back and you say, well, it doesn't have an American passport. I was actually really upset. At the moment, we're trying to do petitions, but the petitions for the government of Iran only work when you have huge names. We're writing letters. Most newspapers don't want to publish those letters at op-eds anymore because it's not topical anymore. And when I was in Italy, every single person talked about Jafar Kamri. In this country, nobody knows who he is. He won the Golden Lion in uh, Venice, and um, he has the white ribbon and the circle. But yeah, and he's after Kiyosami, Jafar Kamri is the most significant and the only crime he has is he wore green shawls in Montreal as he was um, in the jury uh, at the festival. And then later he showed up at the funeral of Neda. And later um, they took his passport away and he still was talking publicly. I guess he, he wasn't silent enough. So now they've, apparently they've given him three years, or I heard lately, and 50 beats and shadows and shit. Slash. Lashes. Lashes, yeah. And, and this is unacceptable. This is unacceptable, and this is a lawless country. But we say artists belong to the world. I'm sorry, but all these prisoners need the same. The thing about Jafar Kamahim and his wife said, don't worry, everybody internationally is doing something for you. He said, I don't want you to help me. What about all these other people who are here? If you want to help, help everybody. And, and it's really a difficult situation. This government is atrocious. And there's nothing they can listen to unless Hillary Clinton or Obama goes, unless I don't know who else, but very few people. I'm going on about this. Sorry, I don't want this to be into a political rally, but thank you. I, I think by mentioning his name every time you can, so he's, he's not forgotten. I think everybody got really depressed. <laughs> Uh, speaking of being an activist, I, knowing that Barack Obama has admitted that the United States has had a role in 1953 uh, overthrow, the, and uh, making a film called Women Without Men and uh, that explores, at the very least, the potential of being arrested and, and working out in a country where uh, the where we have the highest uh, female incarceration, uh, both by sheer numbers and by incarceration rate. Um, do, you, do you ever feel pushed to explore uh, whether this place that, that uh, you are now working from, uh, what its role is in, the, in creating the situations that, you're, that you have explored so far through your work? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, I feel as American as the onion. And I think this film, in a way, is the first time that I bring the critique into this country, um, because um, this country is not as innocent as it looks. Uh, and as much as I love being an American, I also think that if there is democracy, we should be able to criticize ourselves. And that this film, and me and Shoja are deciding to put so much focus, because in the novel, it actually just is in the background, the 1953 coup. The reason that we wanted to emphasize that is because there's an amnesia about certain criminal behavior of this country in other foreign nations. Um, and in fact, that Iran had democracy, and that this was an entire conspiracy that was organized by the CIA, that ever since September 11, there was all kinds of debates about the groundwork of the antagonism between Iran, Middle East, and the US. No one seems to be talking about it. And the US talks about going to Afghanistan and Iraq to bring democracy when they, in fact, overthrew democracy. I mean, assuming that Dr. Mossad was a democratic leader, and I think most of us believe he was. So I think this brings back the subject to Americans and say, you know, and I think we try to work carefully in the story where you have the, the lovely American woman as being the one that 
all the men admire. Um, uh, everything American is like admired, etc. But we were so heavily betrayed. Um, so it's us looking back at this country and its own history in countries that now appear so barbaric and inferior, and it, it declares itself as a superior and, and, and the right uh, one. And so uh, I think at the same time that I myself have so much problem with my own country and government, I really think that a lot of Iranian feel, people feel a lot of resentment because they feel we wouldn't be where we are today had it not been for the coup d'etat of 1953. So you have had the direct responsibility with our destiny. And I think this is no exaggeration. You just have to look at history. And obviously this country admitted to this conspiracy. So other than that, I'm not a documentary filmmaker. I'm not someone who wants to be didactic in, in a real obvious way. And the only way I can see it is if I can weave this information into a narrative that somehow still becomes a fiction. Uh, and I think, in a way, maybe this is better because um, it's not really biased um, and it really talks the truth, you know. I'm not sure if I answered your question properly. But no, I'm not planning to make a film about CIA in this country. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier, you were talking about how you needed to step away from studio art practice for a little bit and away from the walls of the galleries and how maybe that's just a little world of its own, and uh, you felt that cinema was a bit more democratic. And I see a relationship between you wanting to be an activist and reach more people and do cinema to reach perhaps a larger audience. Do you see yourself making more films, not necessarily documentaries, you just said that you don't have a film here, but more films exploring and reaching larger audiences? There's a part of me that, um, I mean, I think, I feel a part of me is a poet and a part of me is an activist. And the poet needs solitary space and the activist needs a community. And cinema is that community, you know. Um, but uh, we just shot some photographs um, for the first time since 1997, which I'm looking forward to. Um, the thing is that I think film is art. I, I don't feel like I've stopped making art because I'm making film. I think every single frame in this film is either a painting or a photograph. Um, so I, I don't feel like um, I have stopped my development um, as, as a visual artist. Uh, I feel like I'm incorporating it in new ways um, and wondering whether you could be a visual artist and still tell a story. Um, but I love the audience of cinema. I love the engagement of the audience in cinema in the way they really give you the attention. I'm frustrated by I mean, Shoja and I argue, he says, look at Museum of Modern Art and how many thousands of people come and go. This is true, we have a tremendous audience for art. But there's something about the attention span that when people offer you and they watch a film, many people can walk out, but those who are absorbed, you know, that you can be so complete in a way of, of visually and sonically and narratively affect people. You have really, you become God. You know? <laughs> Where with a picture, you, you have a limited possibility, but um, I don't know. I think well, I would like to keep exploring and doing new things. I have found a new project that I like to do, a new novel, another big ambitious thing, but uh, I'm excited about it, and we'd like to take the next chances and risk. I know you must be so tired. I talk so much. Uh, I just want to say thank you for being such an attentive audience. And I'm sorry that Shoja didn't speak much. Uh, he's a very good, he's exhausted. Or he, um, but thank you for being here. Please support us in seeing the film. We need your support, otherwise it will be a failure, for sure. <laughs> thank you.